Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for other churches today as well that are assembling as we are. It's our custom here to be mindful of the kingdom, not just here at Grace Point, but of other great churches that are doing wonderful things for the kingdom as well. So we want to pray for them as well as us. Would you join me in doing that? Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to be here today in this place that we call Grace Point Fellowship. And we appreciate so much the DNA that you've given us as a church to express ourselves, our love for you, our ministry for you. But we're also mindful that there are other wonderful churches with their own DNA of how they conduct worship and how they serve and minister in your name as well. And so we pray that you will be with your church today wherever it assembles, that you'll bless other churches as you do us, that they'll experience and realize the reality of your word where Jesus, you reminded us that you would build your church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against us. Lord, thank you for that promise in these often despairing times and dark times when it seems like wrong often prevails over right. It's encouraging to be reminded that you are still in control and that all things are working together for good. And so we rest in that today. Thank you for your word that we're about to open, for the truth that we're about to explore. And I pray that simply we would leave today a little closer to you than before we came in. That we would sense your great love for us and that we would leave with a heart's desire to serve others as you have served us and given your life to us. So bless every person here, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. Good morning. It's glad to see you this morning. Good to have you with us. Uh, I want to welcome our uh, mission team from Africa back. They had a very successful trip and be uh, looking forward to debriefing with them and sharing with you on how we're going to establish a partnership with uh, churches and pastors over in Kenya. And speaking of Africa, I do want to remind you that this Wednesday evening here at Grace Point, the uh, African Children's Choir will be here. We're excited to host these orphans from Africa who are going to be here to sing and dance and bless us uh, in their ministry. And so that's at 7 o'clock. I want to encourage you to come early. I have a feeling the auditorium will be packed. And so uh, bring your family and friends and, uh, and enjoy a Wednesday evening with the African Children's Choir. And then also looking ahead to Christmas Eve, which is a week from tomorrow, just a reminder that we'll have two Christmas Eve services. Christmas Eve is an, is an opportunity for you to bring family, friends, neighbors. Uh, they're very open typically to coming on Christmas, and so we encourage you to invite them to either our 12 uh, noon service or our 4 p.m. service. Two services, they're both the same at noon and 4 on Christmas Eve. This year we have a special treat. About 30 of our children from our children's ministry will be on stage as a choir to sing with us as well as uh, some band members from the Phoenix High School will be here to help us in a rendition of Little Drummer Boy. I'm looking forward to that. So it's a wonderful service we have planned for you. So mark that on your calendars for Christmas Eve. A lot of other stuff in your bulletins. Just take some time to go through it. If you're interested, uh, there's an outline you can pull out right now and fill in the blanks as we go through God's Word. And speaking of that, open to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We're, uh, we're taking a, a couple of weeks to go through the traditional Christ Christmas story, but look at it uh, kind of through the lens of, uh, of the great classic story, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. You know the story of how the Grinch wanted to steal so desperately the Christmas joy from the people of Hoosville. And in much the same way, although not mythical characters like the Grinch or his dog Max, there are modern day Grinches that want to steal us of joy as well. We talked last week about the burden of guilt and how guilt, especially at this time of the year, can oftentimes uh, discourage us and uh, help us to miss the, uh, the joy of the season. And so we were reminded last week of some pretty shady people and the genealogical record of Jesus and his coming into the world. We talked about four outcast women, a, a prostitute, a harlot, a, 
a fornicator. And we looked at these women and thought, how in the world could they be in the genealogical record? But we were reminded last week, if you were here, that the spotlight was not on those women. The spotlight was on God's incredible grace, that God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for each and every one of us. And so if you're like me, there's stuff in your past and oftentimes shame and guilt and regret and all those things can rise to the surface and God doesn't want us to live in that guilt and shame. He wants us to be set free from it and understand that Jesus came to bring us grace. Today I want to talk with you about how another Grinch can easily slip in and cause us to miss the true reason for the season. I want to talk with you about how greed can steal your, your Christmas joy. Uh, if you're familiar with the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas, then you know that the Grinch was so irritated with the people of Whoville celebrating Christmas every year that one year he made his way down into Whoville on a Christmas Eve and he stole all of the Who's presents from under their trees. And he thought that with them stolen away, he would also steal away their Christmas joy. But something far different happened as we read in Dr. Seuss's story. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still a bed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo, poo to the who's, he was grinchously humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes, then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. It's easy, oftentimes in the culture in which we live, to remember what Christmas is really all about, isn't it? It's easy to believe in our culture that it's all about the gifts. It's all about the presents that we will receive. That's just how it works. We receive and we get. How many of you have uh, seen the movie A Christmas Story? You probably have. It's one of the old-time favorites. This little boy named Ralphie wants more than anything else this Red Ryder BB gun, right? And his mom and his dad stonewall him all the way up to Christmas on why he's not going to get the gun. They're just convincing him it's not going to happen. You remember what his parents' reasoning was? You'll shoot your eye out, right? It's a great movie, but if you think about it, it really does summarize what Christmas in America has come to be all about. It's about the gifts, the things that we can get or the things that we can give. And you know, hear me, there's nothing wrong with receiving a gift or giving a gift, but that's not what Christmas is all about. There has to be more to Christmas than that, than this greedy consumer mentality of what am I going to get? And if we're not careful, that consumer mentality or greed can steal away the true meaning of Christmas. And believe it or not, there's a character in the biblical narrative of the Christmas story of the birth of Jesus 
That is the characterization of the bad side of Christmas, the greedy side of Christmas, the selfish side of Christmas. And his name is Herod. And what I'd like to do this morning is uh, read you a part of the Christmas story from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 2, where Herod had his role. And so if you have your Bibles open, Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, this is what we read. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem, and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Herod had no interest in worshiping Jesus. Herod had every interest in eliminating Jesus. And the reason is because Herod was incredibly insecure. Herod wanted no competition for his reign as the king over his people. And in that sense, he was incredibly greedy. He didn't want anybody taking over his kingdom. In fact, if you have your outlines out under that title, Looking at Herod, let me give you three summary statements that will tell you everything you need to know about Herod. The first is that he was greedy. If you know the history of those times, then you would understand that kings were given to be greedy. I mean, that's just who they were. But Herod, when you understand the history of his reign, took it to an unhealthy extreme. He was an extremely greedy person. Uh, A great example of Herod's greed is is recorded in Scripture. Under Herod's uh, reign, the Jews were complaining that the temple that had been destroyed in 70 AD by the Babylonians had not been rebuilt. It was still lying in ruins. And so Herod says to the Jews, if I rebuild your temple, will you relax a little bit more and will you you become a little more subservient to me? Will you be better loyal subjects to me? And the Jews said, yeah, if you'll rebuild the temple, we'll do that. And so Herod did that. He rebuilds this temple that is unbelievable. It's off the charts in grandeur and beauty. Gold and marble and jewels everywhere. There was a saying that circulated at that time, you have not seen beauty until you have seen Herod's temple. But do you notice something about that statement? It wasn't God's temple. It wasn't even the Jews' temple. It came to be known as Herod's temple. Why? Because it was all about Herod. It was all about his greed. It was all about his insecurity, his need for recognition, his need for more and more stuff. And before we become too critical of Herod, uh, what about us? Oftentimes, I think you would probably have to agree with me that it is all about the stuff that we have, because at times we're pretty into our stuff. I love George Carlin's rendition of stuff. He writes, that's all you need in life, a little place for your stuff. 
that's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You can see that when you're taking off in an airplane. You look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. All the little piles of stuff. And when you leave your house, you got to lock it up. I mean, wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. And they always take the good stuff. <laughs> they, they never bother with the worthless stuff. All they want is the shiny stuff. That's what your house is. A place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. <laughs> Sometimes you got to move, got to get a bigger house. Why? No room for your stuff anymore. <laughs> Did you ever notice that when you go to somebody else's house, you never quite feel 100% at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. Somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And if you stay overnight, unexpectedly, they give you a little bedroom to sleep in. Bedroom they haven't used in about 11 years. Someone died in it 11 years ago. <laughs> and they haven't moved any of his stuff. Right next to the bed, there's usually a dresser or a bureau of some kind, and there's no room for your stuff on it. Somebody else's stuff is on the dresser. Sometimes you leave your house to go on vacation. You've got to take some of your stuff with you. You've got to take about two big suitcases full of stuff when you go on vacation. You've got to take a smaller version of your house. It's the second version of your stuff. And you're going to fly all the way to Honolulu. Going to go across the continent, cross half an ocean to Honolulu. You, you get down to the hotel room in Honolulu and you open up your suitcase and you got to put away all your stuff. Here's a place here. Put a little bit of stuff there. Put some stuff here. Put some stuff over there. I'll put some stuff another place here. Look at this. Here's a place for some stuff. I'll put it there. And even though you're far away from home, you start to get used to it. You start to feel okay. Because after all, you do have some of your stuff with you. That's when your friend calls up from Maui and says, hey, why don't you come over to Maui for the weekend and spend a couple of nights over here? Oh, no. What do I pack? Right? You've got to pack an even smaller version of your stuff, the third version of your house, just enough stuff to take to Maui for a couple of days. You get over to Maui. I mean, you're really getting extended now when you think about it. You've got stuff all the way back on the mainland, you got stuff on another island. You got stuff on this island. I mean, supply lines are getting longer and harder to maintain. You, you get over to your friend's house on Maui, and he gives you a little place to sleep, a little bed right next to his windowsill or something, and you put some of your stuff up there. You've got your visine. You've got your nail clippers. You, you, you put everything up. It takes about an hour and a half, but after a while, you finally feel okay. You say, all right, I got my nail clippers. I must be okay. That's when your friend says, hey, I think tonight we'll go to the other side of the island, visit a pal of mine, and maybe stay over there. No way. What do you do now? What do you pack? you got to pack an even smaller version of your stuff, the fourth version of your house. Only the stuff you know you're going to need, money, keys, comb, wallet, hanky, pen, and change. Only the stuff you hope you're going to need. It's all about stuff. And we're reminded at times during the Christmas season that it can be all about the stuff. So the Bible reminds us very clearly in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, when you think about Herod and his greed, the Bible says this, don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. It's easy, isn't it, for us to worship things rather than the Creator of those things. So greed characterized Herod's life. And because greed consumed him, here's a byproduct of that. And if we're careful, not careful, we fall right into it. The second thing about Herod is that he was never satisfied. He was all about gathering more and more stuff, never had enough, just wound up needing more and more and more, and we are the same way. If we're not careful, stuff never satisfies. Solomon is a great example of this. You know, the Bible says that these things were written to instruct us so we can look at the lives of people who have lived before us and 
see how they handled situations like we are faced with often in our lives. And Solomon, king of Israel, had a lot of stuff, and he writes about it. And he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, his journal, beginning at verse 9, he said, So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, if I could phrase it this way, when I looked at all my stuff, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Uh, that's an honest admission of how if we chase after the wrong things, they don't satisfy. So here's Herod. He rebuilds the temple, and it's named Herod's Temple. He builds a to-die-for palace for himself. I mean, we're talking about a huge home that was ornate, but that wasn't enough. He built a second palace for himself, which was off the charts, but then he builds a third palace as well, and he builds that one over water. He's just continually trying to find satisfaction in all this stuff. And the story of Herod is that he just kept building and building, but he was never satisfied. And then he died. And when did the greed end? At his death. The third thing about Herod was that his greed led him to become corrupt and led him into corruptible things. So you think about it, Her after Herod was fooled by the wise men, so you know he had sent the wise men, he wants to find out where the baby Jesus is because he wants to kill baby Jesus. And after the wise men were warned by God to go back to their homes in a different way, Herod, what does he do? Well, if you go back to Matthew chapter 2 and you look at verses 16 through 18, he did the unthinkable. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Herod went on this incredible killing spree. History tells us that Herod was even responsible for murdering his favorite wife. Yeah, you heard me right. Of multiple wives, his favorite wife. Does that strike you as somewhat odd? He murdered his wife's grandfather. He murdered three of his sons, dozens of other people. Why? You know why? Because Herod didn't want anybody else messing with his stuff. The Bible says in Psalm 14:1, only fools say in their hearts there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. So that's Herod. Herod has no belief in anyone but himself, and so he is building this empire for himself and goes on this siege of corruption to maintain what he feels is stability for himself. So how should I summarize Herod? Well, if I were to summarize Herod, I would say he's not a good role model for your kid or mine. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be Herod. He was a bad man. He was a very bad man. And so you look at Herod, and I'll share a little bit more about him in just a moment. What are some of the lessons we can learn? So we have the Bible, not just as a history lesson, but we have it as a lesson for life. What can we learn? We don't want to be like Herod. So let me give you a few points. They're obvious, but let me share them with you anyway. The first lesson is this. Don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Instead, spread generosity not just at Christmas, but throughout the entire year. If Herod is a stranger to you, maybe there's another character that we often read about this time of the year, the Christmas season, who uh, epitomizes greed. You remember his name, Ebenezer Scrooge, right? Think of Herod as an Ebenezer Scrooge. 
what made Scrooge a Scrooge. It was his lack of generosity. It was his failure to use his resources to bless others. He kept them all for himself. So we learn what it's all about. Don't be greedy. Instead, be incredibly generous. That's what I love about our mission blessing here at the church because it really causes us to pause and look around and find someone that, that, that maybe is a little needier than we are and how can we bless them with a portion of our tithe that we would normally give to the church. Don't be greedy, instead be generous. Another lesson that we learn is this, don't be dissatisfied. Instead, practice a lifestyle of contentment. Uh, if you want to turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verses 17 through 19, this is what Paul, the apostle, wrote to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. He said, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. By the way, would you agree with that? Trusting in money, it's pretty unreliable. The market goes up, the market goes down. You can be a hero one day, a zero the next. Isn't that true? Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Look at verses 6 through 8 of that same chapter. When you talk about dissatisfaction, Paul says to Timothy, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Don't love money, the Bible says. Be satisfied with what you have. So how do you do that? And here's my thought. If this works for you, take it home and put it to work. I think to reach a level of contentment, we have to ask ourselves at some point, how much is enough? How much is enough? When do you say that's enough? You know, Howard Hughes was once asked, well, how much do you need? And his response was what? Just a little bit more. If we never come to a place where we go, well, really, this is all we need, we're never going to reach a level of contentment that God says is a blessing to us. So when do you say that's enough? Because if you don't, you become, in many ways, like Herod. You have one palace, then another, then another, then another, and it only stops when? It only stops when you die. And the reality is, when you die, guess what? None of your stuff goes with you. So how much is enough? And just this just came to my mind so consider this a bonus. I think as we get older, if we're wise, we get that a little better. Because most people that I know who get older don't build bigger houses for themselves. They typically downsize because they come to realize we don't need all this stuff, right? Right? So don't be dissatisfied. Ask yourself, how much is enough? And then thirdly, don't be corrupt. <laughs> Instead, see the bigger picture of eternity. Begin to live with eternity in view. So, so go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul says to the young preacher, but people who long to be rich fall in temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, notice, you probably are familiar with this. Uh, money is not evil. Money is a neutral commodity. It's neither good nor bad. It's what we choose to do with our money. It's when we love money more than anything else that it becomes evil. And so the question, I think, if we're wise 
we ask ourselves is, well, what am I going to do with my money? How am I going to be a good steward of my money? So the eternal perspective that Jesus gives us is this. In Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves riches on earth where moth and rust corrupt and destroy, but store up for yourselves riches or treasures in heaven. In other words, have a perspective that expands beyond just this world. Realize that nothing you accomplish here is going to be carried with you there except for what you've done for God. That's one of the reasons why I love Rick Warren so much. Uh, I believe Rick Warren is America's pastor today. Uh, I really do believe that. I, he's a man of God. He's, you know, when he wrote his book, The Purpose Driven Life, he became an instant millionaire. How can you write the best-selling nonfiction book in the history of America, the history of the world, and not become rich? And he did. He became very rich. But it didn't change his life. He lives in the same home. He drives the same car. He and his wife made a decision that they would send their treasures ahead. They reverse tithe. They give 90% of their income back to the kingdom of God. Someone asked him one time, well, why do you do that? His simple response was, we want to build treasures in heaven. So the true spirit of Christmas is a spirit of generosity because God has given us the gift of his son. God so loved the world that he gave his very only son to us. We are free then to give of ourselves. We're free to first give to God and then to give of ourselves to others. So with all of that in mind, it's a simple message. As we approach the celebration of Christmas in just a few days, let me give you three personal challenges from my home to yours, if you will. The first challenge I would give you at this time of the season especially is this. Relax a little more. <laughs> Isn't it ironic that at this season of the year when we should be relaxing and enjoying family and friends, we fill our schedules so full we don't have the time to do that? The invitation of Jesus is this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Jesus didn't say, come to me, and I'll give you long lines at the mall. Jesus didn't say, come to me, and I'll give you gridlock traffic, migrating, migraine headaches, stress upon stress. My encouragement to us as a family of God at Christmas, really at every season of the year, is find some time to rest, because when you find some time to slow down and rest, it gives you time to reflect. And when you have time to reflect... Your life will change because you're looking upon the things that truly matter. And you'll find then his peace. So over the next few days, find some time to relax. Maybe sit down, reread the Christmas story. Get a cup of cider. Build a fire if you have a fireplace. And reflect on the true meaning of it all. I don't know what that looks like for you and how you would do that, but just do it. Just do it. Find some time to relax. Secondly, reflect on the bigger picture. Move past what I would call myopic vision, tunnel vision. Expand your vision and begin to see things as God sees them. That's what Paul said he did in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Boy, there's wisdom. Everything you see now will one day be gone, but the things you cannot see will last forever. The bigger picture is that it's not all about stuff. The bigger picture is that it's all about people. The two great commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The only two things you take into eternity are your love for God, the word of God, and your relationships, people. It's all about relationships. That's why I was so blessed yesterday when my grandson Noah wanted to come hang with Grandpa. Hey, what are you doing? No, just hanging out at the house. Grandma's shopping. So he came over and just hung out with me. We had six wonderful hours together. His mom called and said, when you're sick of him, bring him home. I said, oh, you don't want us to bring him home, huh? <laughs> I introduced Noah yesterday to his first victory dog. You know what that is? Yeah. 
the little cart right over here. Every hot dog has bacon on it. Yeah. <laughs> when we get a glimpse of that, we unlock the, 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 the whole key to, to happiness and joy, don't we? It's about people. It's about relationships. It's about establishing those in our lives. And Herod, and here's what I'll share with you about his life, tragically illustrates the pain of a life that never had those kinds of relationships. Because he was so focused on stuff and the wrong things, he never built relationships with people. And so at the end of his life, Herod contracted what we know today to be cancer. It spread through his stomach, it spread through his intestines, and he's lying on his deathbed, and as he's lying on his deathbed, he did the unthinkable. He called his lieutenants into his room, and he issued a command to go throughout his kingdom and find all of the leaders of the Jews, to take them forcibly, if necessary, and imprison them, and then at his death, to kill them. And when one lieutenant asked him why he would want to do that, this is what Herod said, and I quote, No one will mourn over my death. At least this way, they will mourn at my death. Wow. You know, the Bible says it's better to go to a funeral home than to a party. So let me ask you this, fast forward to your deathbed. Who will mourn your loss? How many people will gather to say farewell to you and to speak over your life, how it impacted theirs? Herod was smart enough to know that he had a lot of stuff in his life, but he didn't have anyone in his life. Even Herod understood the bigger picture at his death. When it's all said and done, it's all about what? Relationships. It's all about relationships. And then thirdly, if I could encourage you to do anything, and this kind of piggybacks on what I shared last week if you were here. If not, let me give you a little insight as to what I shared. Embrace God's forgiveness and healing. Many of us here today, in fact, let me, let me rephrase that. That's what I wrote in my notes. Let me rephrase it. All of us here today have probably made a lot of mistakes in our lives. And this Christmas, as I shared last week, may bring to your memory the pain maybe of a broken relationship, a moral failure, a painful addiction that you're dealing with. Every one of us here today, as you look back over your life, you have regrets, you have sorrows. And here's what I know to be true, and I know you know it to be true as well. There's no rewind button on life. There's no do-overs. We can't go back and change what has happened. But, but we can remember this. Why did Jesus come? I mean, what's the whole point of Christmas? Why, why did he come? Well, listen to the words of Jesus through the prophet Isaiah. 700 years before Jesus was even born, through the prophet, Jesus foretold the reason for his coming. And this is what he said, For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Jesus wasn't talking about people held behind literal bars and locked doors. Jesus was talking about people who were held prisoner to their past, to their regrets, to their mistakes, to their failures. And Jesus says, I have come to comfort those who are brokenhearted over those past regrets and mistakes to break us free from the prison of our past, to release us 
as captives that are set free. That's what Christmas is all about. And so Christmas is a good time, and my encouragement to you is to do this, to pause and realize the hope and forgiveness that this child represents to all of us. Maybe today would be a good time for you to lay your life at the foot of this child if you've never done that before. Maybe today would be a good time to bring this child who was born to be your savior. Bring him all of your hurts, bring him all of your pain and just drop him at his feet and say, Lord, set me free. If it's a difficult season for you, you have a broken heart, you're in pain, there's stress, there's trauma, whatever it might be, I want to challenge you to bring all of that brokenness, all of that pain, all that despair, all that heartache to Jesus, because that's why he came. Jesus is not just an, an historical figure. Jesus is the reality of God on earth. Jesus is God in flesh who came to redeem and restore, to replace sorrow for joy pain for healing. Jesus said, I was sent to comfort the brokenhearted, to set the prisoners free. And that promise is for every one of us who's here today. Receive that. Receive that. And then share it wherever you go. That's the heart of Christmas. Would you pray with me? So, Father, as I sat in the back before the service and during the service and watched people enter, faces that I know and some that I don't, I was reminded that even though I may not know the story of every person that has come here today, that you do. You know every person's story. You know every heartache. You know every tear that maybe has been shed this day or this week. You know every fear. You know even, Father, the shame or guilt or regret that some maybe have brought into this room today. And I would ask you, Jesus, by the power of your Spirit, to just speak your love over every life that is here to remind us of the simple truth of Scripture that our God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son so that we would not have to experience death but that we could experience life in its fullness. I pray that over everyone here today. Speak to every heart. Free us from guilt. Free us from greed. May we take the true spirit of Christmas, the giving of your son, and may we pay it forward into the lives of those that you bring to us. In Jesus' name. What a beautiful